Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson, the past brought to life by those who were there. This week, the mysterious death of Mozambique's President Samora Michel. My mission was to try to establish whether or not that this was in fact an assassination rather than an accident. Plus, a survivor of the Moscow theatre siege. People seem to turn to stone in shock. Just imagine, a group captured a thousand people with great ease. And inside the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember leaving the president's office in the White House. It was a beautiful fall evening in Washington. And it sounds melodramatic for me to say this, but I thought I might never live to see another Saturday night. That's all coming up later in the podcast. But we begin on the streets of London in the years after the end of the Second World War. Britain and the Allies had spent six long years and an enormous amount of blood and treasure in the defeat of fascism in Europe. The horrors of the Nazi concentration camps and the extermination camps were fresh in the memory. And yet, even in this environment, a strand of British fascism re-emerged as a political movement in the late 1940s. But this time, with the experience of what Europe had just been through, these British fascists were confronted by a group of predominantly Jewish ex-servicemen and volunteers. Alex Last has been speaking to one of them. The anti-Semitism was vitriolic. People standing on the platform, shouting out the same abuse you heard before the war. The only way to beat them was go for them before they came to us. And so we did. We didn't look away, we didn't bow, we went for them. Jules Konopinski was born into a Jewish family in Breslau, a town in Germany in 1930. Persecuted by the Nazis, his family managed to escape Germany just before the Second World War began. They made it to Britain and settled in the east end of London, a relatively deprived area which since the late 19th century had become home to a large Jewish immigrant community. But there was a lot of anti-Semitism there too, as Jules discovered when he went to school. The school was in Bethnal Green. The whole area was a hotbed of anti-Semitism. Racial abuse, verbal abuse. In fact, in order to get to school, a friend of mine, we had to go into Victoria Park, which was next to the school, and we used to take on all comers back to back, and fight the world. In the 1930s, the British fascist movement led by Sir Oswald Mosley had grown in popularity. They styled themselves on the Nazis and the Italian fascists and called themselves black shirts because of their uniform. They claimed to have tens of thousands of members. They had prominent aristocratic support. And they were even praised in the popular newspapers The Daily Mail and The Daily Mirror by the right-wing press baron Viscount Rothermere. They would hold rallies and marches, often targeting East London. During the Second World War, Mosley and hundreds of his fascist supporters were finally detained. But as the war came to an end, they were released, and unrepentant fascist groups re-emerged, holding rallies in London and around the country. From then on, openly in the streets, you had public meetings shouting out the same antagonism and the same filth as before the war. And now even worse, they say the gas chambers weren't enough. We didn't kill enough. Knowing that all our family had been wiped out. It was very disturbing. And I, for one, I I could not stand by I would not allow this thing to happen. No way. So with other people, we got together and decided that if the authorities will do nothing, then we must do it ourselves. So British Jewish ex-servicemen got together to form an organisation known as the 43 Group to expose the fascist threat and battle them on the streets. There are various stories about the origins of the name, among them that 43 people were present at the first meeting. But the group included former commandos, paratroopers, airmen and naval personnel, decorated war heroes, as well as civilian volunteers, men and women, and it had non-Jewish members too. Jules Konopinski was one of the young, tough Jewish East End lads 
who joined up. I was a strong young lad, didn't know any fear, never gave ground. There was no membership card, but the actual members at one time reached well over a 1,000 in London. And there was training too for the recruits. There were boxing gymnasiums, private trainers, karate trainers. Don't forget, people that came out, the army were highly trained. They trained us how to defend ourselves and also how to hurt. I know it's a sad reflection now, but um, we felt it was something that had to be done. The 43 group would try to gain intelligence on where the fascist meetings were taking place. To do this, some even went undercover inside the fascist movement. We had three aims. One was to get information. Two is to expose them. And three, we had to counter their publications because they were selling their newspapers on street corners. The 43 group would organise themselves to disrupt fascist meetings, overturning the speaker's platform, disperse their followers. And if that meant punch-ups, which it usually did, that was fine too. We knew where they were going to be and we were there waiting for them. In order to dissuade them from coming again, they were sometimes physically molested and told, don't come back. Sometimes there was a rush forward to turn the platform over. Eventually they they brought along their strong-arm people that led to fighting. Did you get into many scrapes yourself? Yes, very much so. I ended up at the Old Bailey in 1948 on a charge of a fray conspiracy of which I was found not guilty. I'm not ashamed to say that I've received many good hiding myself. It wasn't all one-sided because uh, these people were highly trained as well. In post-war Britain, fascists seized on events in British-controlled Palestine where Zionist groups seeking the creation of a Jewish state carried out deadly attacks on British security forces. A lot of people were hurt on both sides, but it caused a great deal of stress over here because now the people who didn't like us had a reason. You've killed our sergeants, you've killed our soldiers, you've done this. Jules himself sneaked out of the country to fight for newly established Israel. He then came back to London to battle the fascists on the streets again. London's Black Sunday begins as Mosley's union movement rallies in Ridley Road, Dalston. Holding in check angry crowds, 400 police handle a tough job with restraint but firmly. Arresting 34... There was demonstrations, there was public riots in the streets. Three or four thousand police were on duty, police horses. It was. It became a daily routine for problems. Did you see Mosley yourself in person? I've seen him speaking. I, I must say, I mean, he was a most charismatic person. He always stood with his hands on his hips. And I must say, he, as far as I can see, he's never mentioned the word Jew. He was a very clever orator. The aliens... That was his expression. These aliens, these aliens. Obviously, the aliens he was addressing were us. The impact of the 43 group can be debated. Not everyone in the Jewish community agreed with its tactics. But it would become more sophisticated, and certainly the physical threat of the 43 group worried the fascist leaders and their followers. It was demonstrated most clearly in the town of Brighton, where the local police decided to give the fascist marchers only token police protection. Mosley decided to march in Brighton and took down a very large contingent. Police superintendent sent down three policemen and one on a bicycle. And when Mosley protested about it, he said that is the legal requirements. And he decided to march. And they hadn't got very far when the world descended upon them. There was fighting going on all over Brighton. It was a bad day for them. They had a very bad day. As the years went by, Mosley and his friends failed to establish themselves as a political force. The numbers at their meetings dwindled, and as the threat diminished, in 1952, the 43 group was persuaded to disband, though it would become a model for future anti-fascist groups when Mosley rallied again a decade later, this time targeting Caribbean immigrants. As for Jules Konopinski... He went on to start a family and run a successful retail business. But he has no regrets for his decision to take up the battle on the streets of London. None of us wanted notoriety. None of us did it for gain. We all had a lot to lose. I, I think that what we did had to be done. If we hadn't done it, things could have been a lot worse. History might have changed. 
the anti-fascist veteran Jules Konopinski speaking to Alex last. So how was it possible that British fascists could reappear immediately after a war against the Nazis and still apparently be taken seriously by some? I'm joined now by Professor Nigel Copsey of Teesside University, who is a historian and specialist in fascism and anti-fascism in Britain. It does almost beggar belief that the fascists sort of taken hold in, even in a small way in Britain. Mm. How so? Well, the interesting thing here is that the, uh, the British fascists never really went away. During the war, over 800 of the leading uh, fascist activists were interned, and during this period of internment, they continued to follow their pre-war leader, Sartreville Mosley, with absolute, utter devotion. So they kept the sacred flame alive. So internment was like a kind of martyrdom, you know, so whereby on release, fascists felt uh, purified, they felt reborn. So it's kind of paradoxical, but many felt they'd not lost the war, but had won it. So many interned fascists in Britain and internment served to reinvigorate them, intensified their ideological faith. It became a badge of honour. So for British fascists, despite everything, fascism hadn't died in 1945. It may, for the rest of us, you know, it may well have been, or absolutely was discredited and disgraced. But for them, the idea was still alive and it could be revived. So, in a sense, the fact that they were interned act almost as, a, uh, as an incubator for the ideals, even though, as you say, the rest of the world saw the horrors of what emerged uh, from Nazi Germany. That's right. That's exactly right, yeah. Uh, what did they want, though? I mean, clearly they had seen uh, fascism defeated in Europe. What did the British fascists, after the Second World War, think that they were going to get? Well, the fascists were motivated by different things. I mean, for some, it gave vent to their anti-Semitic prejudices. And in many cases, you know, this was a real deep pathological hatred of Jews. Others saw in fascism the possibility of saving uh, the British Empire from decline. And then you had Mosley himself. Mosley attempted to distance himself from his pre-war fascism. So he made repeated pledges to democracy, he developed a new programme which was called Europe a Nation. So he called for Europeans to unite under a common government, a common market. But the problem for him was that his supporters, and let's be, you know, let's be honest here, there were not that many of them, um, a few thousand at most, they harked back to the Britain first fascism of the 30s and found the shift in Mosley's thinking very difficult to stomach. But but the anti-Semitism remains sort of at the heart of the, um, the, the ideology, if you like, of the, the fascists. And how was that complicated by events after the Second World War in the Middle East with the move to establish the Jewish state, Israel? Well, what, I mean, what fueled the anti-Semitic agitation of the Mosleyites Mosley in, um, in 1947, I think, were certainly you had the events in Palestine where um, two British soldiers had been... Uh, murdered by uh, Zionists, which provided a spark, really, for popular anti-Semitic rioting in various places, in Manchester, in Liverpool, in Glasgow as well, in, in the July of 47. But the fascist agitation itself, I mean, there's no real evidence to suggest that the fascists were behind this rioting. Their agitation was directed towards uh, East London, towards uh, places like Ridley Road in Dalston, um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, I, th I think we, what we need to bear in mind is that, yes, the anti-Semitism was certainly fueled by events in the Middle East, but it was a, but what, but that anti-Semitism was a long-standing phenomenon in, in Britain. Uh, and we heard from uh, Jules Konopinski and the, the, about the 43 group just now. Mm -hmm. um, how effective were they? Was it the fact that um, uh, Jews and their fellows were prepared to stand up to the post-war fascists in Britain. Was that what stopped uh, fascism in post-war Britain taking uh, any further hold? Well, I think I think it's important to uh, put it into its historical context. I mean, given the widespread um, hostility that ordinary, the most, by far the majority of people felt in this country after the war, you know, absolute disgust towards fascism, um, that even without militant anti-fascism, you know, British fascism would have struggled to attract any wider popular support. That said, I think, you know, the 43 group was undoubtedly effective in being able to physically confront and attack and 
I think did ultimately kill off the fascist movement which had emerged following the Second World War. But we also have to bear in mind that the reality is that the 43 Group was only ever partially effective because they also had another aim, and that aim was to impose a ban on fascism. Um, they wanted the Labour government, the post-war Labour government, to impose a ban and to make incitement to racial hatred illegal. Um, and, and they were singularly uh, unsuccessful in those efforts. I mean, the government felt that there was no, lead, no, no real reason to amend the law. They could deal with the situation. Uh, the fascists really didn't pose that much of a threat. So the Labour government just didn't stray from its position and it refused to introduce legislation to suppress fascism. So the picture's a bit mixed. Um, depends on how you measure its effectiveness. I think in terms of um, in, in terms of the war of attrition on the streets, they'd certainly worn down the fascists by early 49. Um, but on the other hand, in terms of actually bringing about government action against fascism, I think uh, you know, they were, were largely unsuccessful in that respect. And we have to remember, of course, that the far right ideology is is an ideology that that, uh, that doesn't go away. It, it reemerges in various forms and in various parts of Europe. That's right. I mean, if you if you look at the far right today, today's far right has become far more sophisticated and it's softened its extremism. You know, the swastika and leather boots uh, have been traded uh, for suits. Uh, you know, very few openly talk about the Jews. The new target is Islam. Fewer still talk about what white racial superiority. Um, but I think the old ideas are still there. They still remain firmly embedded within the far-right psyche. I mean, the best analogy is that of seaside rock. Now, listeners may or may not be familiar with the hard, stick-shaped confectionery that we Brits eat at seaside resorts. But within this seaside rock, there are brightly coloured stripes that run through it, as well as the name of the resort where the rock is sold. And there's the playwright David Edgar once remarked that anti-Semitic Jewish conspiracy theory runs through British fascism like Blackpool runs through seaside rock. And, he's, and he wasn't wrong. And so for all the differences, Britain, fa Brit all their differences, you know, Britain's fascists still have much in common with those fascists of yesteryear that were out agitating in the streets just after the Second World War. Professor Nigel Copsey of Teesside University, many thanks.